Coming up on Rob on the Road, Hearst Castle and Ranch. Come along on the definitive tour of one of California's greatest treasures. <laughs> with a Hearst expert taking us behind closed doors Yay. of the marvelous mansion. California keeps taking my breath away. And later, a private backroads tour with the Hearst in charge of his family's ranch today. That is California. Rob on the Road starts now. And now, Rob on the Road, exploring Northern California. Welcome to a California treasure, Hearst Castle and Ranch in San Simeon. Hearst Castle was the country estate for media mogul William Randolph Hearst. The ranch surrounds Hearst Castle and is closed to the public, but you'll be joining us on a private behind the scenes tour hosted by William Randolph Hearst's great grandson, Steve Hearst. But first, let's begin by exploring a national and California historic landmark, the place that Hearst called La Cuesta Encantada, the Enchanted Hill. We have found the perfect guide for this show here at Hearst Castle. Ty Smith is the Chief of Museum Interpretations. Good to see you, Ty. Welcome to Hearst Castle. Thank you, it's great to be here. And all of that means Chief of Interpretations really is that you have access to everywhere. That's right, I have the, key. <laughs> I have the keys. You have the right. key. <laughs> you are going to show us the beauty of Hearst Castle. You're gonna take us to the very top and inside the vault. Right, we're, we're gonna go behind the scenes and uh, explore all of Hearst Castle. Awesome. You wanted to start here because this is a special spot. Yeah, it, it's, it's really the most fitting place to start any tour of Hearst Castle. This is where his guests would have arrived uh, for the first time to the castle and uh, they would have walked right up these stairs and the first time they beheld the place would have been from right here. Well, we want you to feel like a Hearst guest today. So that's the tour we're giving you. Let's go. Let's go. All right, thanks. <sighs> Look at that. Tie. Yeah, it's, it's a sight to behold. Probably the guests that were here had seen everything, or, or so they thought until they so got they here. So they thought, yeah. yeah. Until they got here. It's massive, I'm, uh, you know, over 100,000 square feet and 48 guest accommodations. And then a number of entertaining rooms, you know, you have the grand formal spaces and sitting rooms um, for each of the guest accommodations. So there, there's a lot, of, a lot of real estate. I've seen well over 150 rooms for some totals. Yeah, I, I would say that's about accurate. Awesome. And this is one of the most famous terraces. You're gonna hear the word view a lot in this show, and this is why. Well, you have you have uh, terraces to host the views. I mean, that, that, that's their purpose. Um, it wasn't just about the architecture. It was about the way the architecture was situated within the larger ranch here at San Simeon. And this is clearly why Hearst had people come up this way. He, he expected that you wouldn't be spending a lot of time inside. This was um, functioned a lot like a European country estate, and he wanted you to be out and about. And so he wanted you to be walking around these terraces. He wanted you to be out playing tennis. He wanted you to be out horseback riding, and maybe you were going down to the beach for a picnic. It wasn't about coming in and staying inside. Yeah, he wanted you to see this. Yeah, <laughs> uh, he owned the view. Literally. <laughs> Literally, yeah. His ranch uh, at the height of it was 250,000 acres and the Hearst family still owns the surrounding 82,000 acres. And even though Hearst himself said, this is about the views, there's so much inside. That is true. Um, it's not just about the views. It was also the perfect backdrop for his vast art collection. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was able to showcase a small percentage of uh, what he had um, here, here at, at the ranch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is, the ranch. Which is really the ranch and the, the Hilltop Estate really functions as um, a Mediterranean village. That was the idea. We've just walked off the terrace in front of the castle to the Neptune Terrace and voila. Overlooking the Neptune pool. The Neptune pool. Uh, there's no water in it right now. It used technology from the 1930s and so there's no liner in it. And so we've drained it and um, what you're seeing is preservation in action. Look at this tie, wow. Casa Grande, the guest cottages are named for their views. Casa Grande is named for its size. Casa Grande. <laughs> <laughs> the big house, and it is. <laughs> this was started in 1919? 1919, yeah. Uh, I think William Randolph Hearst would have liked to build something up here earlier than that, but he um, finally had full control of the family fortune when uh, his mother's unfortunate death in 1919. She died during the worldwide influenza epidemic, the Spanish flu, they called it. 
And so he was 56 years old um, when he started to build his dream house here in San Simeon. How long did it take to build? Almost three decades and you know, it evolved. It started out as one thing and it evolved into this. And uh, it wasn't a place that was just designed on paper and then built in concrete. It was designed and redesigned and built and rebuilt over, over those 30 years. At the time, a $10 million project? Yeah, about that. Um, you know, three and a half million for the art and then another six and a half million or so for the construction. Well, let's go inside. Yeah, we gotta explore it. <laughs> yeah. Rob, welcome to the assembly room. Oh my goodness. Assembly room for where people would assemble. That's right, and kind of a living room for guests who are visiting. Look at these Italian choir stalls. They're from uh, two different churches, uh, Walnut Choir Stalls from Italy, and used here just as wainscoting, really. My goodness, this is breathtaking. And look at the ceilings. Yeah, another uh, Italian uh, walnut carved ceiling. The tapestries. Tapestries, I mean, this is a treasure trove. This would be a fine museum collection for any institution. Here you have tapestries, four from a set of 10, depicting the life and exploits of a Roman general named Scipio Africanus. He defeated Hannibal in the Second Punic Wars. And uh, the larger set belonged to the French royal collection at one point. After the French Revolution, a lot of items were sold and it entered the open art market at that point. Hearst bought them in the early 1920s. Hearst and other collectors were acquiring these things. Art follows money, and so uh, European art followed American money uh, between World War I and World War II. I see icons from churches. So a lot of religious art here. Uh, really reflects the time period from which Hearst was collecting. Uh, this estate featured his Mediterranean, Renaissance, and Gothic art collection and most of the subject matter during that time period was uh, religious in nature, and so that's what you're seeing. And look at the mantle. Yeah, there's kind of a, a neat story behind this one. Um, Hearst didn't buy this from an auction, he bought it actually from the estate of another collector, a New York financier named Charles Barney, who committed suicide, kind of on the eve of the Great Depression, mm. and Hearst bought it. He wrote a letter to Julia Morgan. He said, I purchased the great Barney mantle. I trust you will design a room worthy to receive it. That mantle is the first thing that guests of William Randolph Hearst would have seen when they came in the front door. That's right, and we're a world-class art museum today. His guests, though, didn't come to see the art. His guests were marveling at each other. They wanted to see, and they wanted to be seen, and so if uh, the who's who of the world is sitting right across from you or uh, sharing a seat with you on the couch, um, probably the tapestries don't look so grand, probably the things that are tucked into the corner of the room kind of fade into the background uh, in the presence of a Cary Grant or somebody. One guest did comment about sitting in front of this fireplace and watching a whole trunk of an oak burn inside of it. It's massive. I see a doorknob yeah. behind here. So, uh, May I open it? Yeah, camouflaged into the wainscoting is a door, and the door leads to the refectory, the dining hall. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Look at this. Flanked by these beautiful flags and the back side of the fireplace. Yeah, that's the other big fireplace. Wow. With more beautiful ceilings. My gosh, I can't stop looking. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> You're taking sort of a step back in history in a way because the, uh, we were in the assembly room and the way it's set up is very much in a Renaissance style. And we've taken a step back into the Gothic period here into the refectory. And a refectory uh, historically is where monks or something would take their meals, you know, in a monastic setting. And this setting was far from that. It may have choir stalls from the Gothic era, but when you get down to it, really where the magic was happening was in between um, this narrow table that created a very intimate setting for the very interesting people who were visiting here. And now we're headed into areas that you need the keys. That's right, I've got my big loop of keys, and so we're gonna head down to the uh, basement, and no visitor gets to see this. What is it? It's the vault. All right, let's go. Okay. Every house has storage, but this is her storage. Her storage, uh, hand-carved alabaster globes, uh, doors, carpets, you know, the stuff that's not out on the tour route. Wow. Oh yeah, they literally are vaults. Literally vaults, yes. There are vaults everywhere, but this one you're going to open for us. Yeah, let's go into one of these vaults here. Oh my goodness. Wow, look at this. These are doors? Doors uh, that are uh, where tours go through now, and so it's better to have them down here to protect them. The okay. best way to store a door is the way it, they're intended to hang, so we hang them. Wow. 
And over here, alabaster globes, uh, hand-carved alabaster globes, they would have been on the exterior lights, but they weren't designed to last uh, 100 years in the type of weather that we have here uh, in the winters, and so we protect them down here in the vault. From the sitting room, one of two, the other one is broken in the 2003 earthquake. Yeah, we're in earthquake country. So we had an earthquake in 2003, and it didn't do any significant structural damage. They really built for permanence. They, they knew what they were doing, Julia Morgan and William Randolph Hearst, both of them having you know, survived the 1906 San Francisco earthquake and lost property. Um, so they were cognizant of that when they were building up here, and they sure had it in mind. In the 2003 quake, a couple of pieces in the collection were broken, but conservators for the most part, except for um, that piece, they were re restored. So I grabbed the one piece. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about Julia Morgan. Sure. What an amazing person. Yeah, she's um, the architect. You know, people come up here and marvel at the fact that uh, one person could have been responsible for the construction. She did all the contract for laborers, um, most of them from the Bay Area. She did interior design and the architecture itself, and, and a lot of the um, collaborated on a lot of the treatment for the ground. So she was a total architect. Mm -hmm. And people marvel at the fact that one person could have built this in one lifetime. Architect, interior, interior design, <laughs> engineering that withstood the earthquake. Yeah, absolutely. Another vault and another key. Another key. <laughs> I love that. Open it up for you. Thank you. Sure. Oh my gosh. Wow. Treasures of another kind in a way. What are these? Well, you have things that were never incorporated. Um, a lot of household items, you know, as well. Absolutely beautiful. These are, I guess, pieces that were left over from the outside? Yeah, they would have um, perhaps been incorporated somewhere uh, into the estate, but, but never made it. Look at all of these pieces. Oh, look, may I touch the tile? Okay, you can touch the tile. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> because the tile work here, you see it, you know, out front on the terrace and you see it everywhere. It's, it's spectacular. It's a major part of the design motif, you know, and it brings vivid color uh, into the gardens, into the exterior. It's every, it's everywhere. It's on the top of the towers uh, and, and the dome of the towers. It's on the walkways. It's everywhere. And most of the tiles were designed by Julia Morgan, so she would come up with a sketch and a, and a sense of the color scheme. And then it would be produced usually by California Faience Company in Berkeley. So a lot of California craft went into making this place. So we're leaving the basement and the vaults, and you're taking us to the second floor of Hearst Castle. Yeah, well, you have to see the library, and you have to see some guest accommodations along the way. And then we're going to go back behind closed doors on the top of the towers. Yeah, we're going to sneak up to the towers. I love that. Right off the guest rooms, the library, and you say this is one of your favorite well, rooms. Well, yeah, as a historian, it has to be. Yeah. Look at all of these books. Well, yeah, and about 4,500 books, and it's just what you want a library to be. The classics in literature, it's art, it ar it's architecture, it's history. But then if you look up on top of the bookcases, you have 155 Greek and Etruscan pots. Another way of telling stories. And just to uh, set up exactly where we are in the castle, we're right above the assembly room, the living room, and this is the front of the castle. Right, front of the castle. Facing the ocean. Right. We've made it to the third floor, and it appears to be even more gothic. What you're seeing is uh, something that few of his guests would have seen, and that's his private bedchambers. The Gothic suite is what he called it. The Gothic suite. And, and across the way is his Gothic study. So it really reflects um, his tastes. I think a lot of people walk into this room and they go, well, I, you know, I would have thought his bedroom would be much larger. Um, this is the bedchambers of a much larger suite. And uh, he spent most of his time across the hall in his study. He, he was sort of, I guess, what we call today a workaholic. You know? and, uh, according to those who are close to him, maybe slept four hours a night. So mm. this is just a room to catch a little shut eye. It's not the whole show. <laughs> the whole show <laughs> is above us. Right. <laughs> Let's go up there. Okay. To the top, the celestial suites and the towers. You're going to enjoy the view up from up here. Wow. Beautiful. 
Welcome to the Celestial Suite. Wow. It's normally not on tour. So. This is spectacular. Really behind the scenes now. We're up in the base of the bell tower. My goodness. The Celestial Suite. And I see why you call it this. There's angels mm -hmm. everywhere. And then as the sun gets lower in the sky to the west as it sets, it just floods this light with this wonderful gold tone. Oh. Hedda Hopper said it was like sleeping inside of a gold jewel box. That's exactly <laughs> what it looks like and feels like in here. And to think it was an afterthought. You know, this didn't exist at one time. Uh, Casa Grande was just two levels. They decided to add a third. And in the process of doing that, they felt like they had to heighten the level of the bell towers. And so they took what was unusable open deck space and made it into a pretty spectacular bedroom. So we're in the bell tower. We're in the base of the bell towers. Uh, above us are the bells, and in between us and the bells, a very large tank of water. It's part of the gravity flow water system. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is the celestial sitting room. It connects the two celestial suites in either tower. That's where, how we're going out? Well, we're going we're gonna to go out onto the deck. Are you, are you afraid of heights? N not this oh, one, okay. no. <laughs> got to be kidding me. Wow. That is spectacular. It's all there, that view. California keeps taking my breath away. Well, and, and you're looking out on California as it is, but you're also looking out on California as it was when this was part of Mission San Miguel and it was Mission Cattle that they were running out here. So this is a, a view out onto the 1700s in California. And a lot of the reason that is is because of the continuity of land ownership. The fact that George Hurst came here in 1867, the fact that William Randolph Hearst continued to acquire property in this area, and it's remained in the Hearst family ever since then and has not been developed. You nailed it. I mean, you really are looking back in time. Do you think that William Randolph Hearst had any clue at what a destination location this would be for so many people? I think he probably had an inkling. And I think he did want this to end up in the public realm someday. He would make comments in his later years that this will become a museum someday. This will belong to the public in some way. And I think he maybe had different ideas about what that would be. I do think he might be a little surprised at the fact that we get three quarters of a million people who come here every year and really have since 1958. And it's where California meets the world in a lot of ways. The reason I scour this state and do this show is to explore California and show the beauty that we have here and how it can make you feel. On a personal note, when you stand here and look out, what does it make you feel? Well, um, for me, you know, because I come from a family where I don't, I never got a chance to travel through Europe, maybe this is the closest I've seen to it, you know, and so I'm able to see the treasures of the world really in my own backyard. And um, I get to look back onto the past as well, and, and there's not too many places that are like that, that, that have that unique combination of things, you know, a world-class uh, European art collection, um, an unspoiled landscape, and um, it's a really rich story to tell and share with people, and so, yeah, it makes coming to work every day pretty easy. Yeah, because look what you see, <laughs> the beauty of the California coast. It's all here. Ty, thank you. My pleasure. What Thanks for visiting Hearst Castle. <laughs> Thank you so much for this amazing tour. Yeah, absolutely. The Hearst family legacy still lives on here along the central California coast. Surrounding the Hearst Castle is Hearst Ranch, where the great-grandson of William Randolph Hearst, Steve Hearst, flew in from San Francisco to take us on a private tour of his family's treasure this sprawling, grass-fed cattle ranch, home to the Hearst history. Hi. How you doing? How are you, Steve? Good. I'm Rob Stewart. Hey, Rob, how are you doing? Nice to see you. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for doing this. No problem. You're gonna give us sort of a behind the scenes tour. Well, it's, it's the scene. <laughs> but this area is, this is all closed to the public. Yes, you're in the middle of 128 square miles. The only thing that is open to the public is the castle, which is 128 acres. It's absolutely beautiful out here today. And I know this goes so deep with you, you know, not just here for you today, but back in your family history. We're going to oh, talk sure. about all of that sure. today. So we're excited. Good. As am I. 
There is so much land here, 82,000 acres. Yes. And how much of it is actually used for cattle grazing? Well, you can graze about half of the acreage. Look at this house. This is the senator's house. Yes, it is. For your great, great grandfather. Correct. Built in the 1870s? 1878. You know, this was, this was vacation. This was summer vacation. So um, we would take this house and the bunkhouse over there. The kids normally got stuck over at the bunkhouse because it's not quite as luxurious. Uh, there's a few of us that know the property well enough to where we can take off and be gone for, you know, the whole day and, and not even touch the borders. A lot of the family comes here and spends their time with kids and frisbees in the yard. Well, isn't that what life is really all about? Uh, I think so, I think so. Does all of this rest on your shoulders? I don't, I don't think it rests on my shoulders. I guess it, it you know, technically does, but it's, I, don't, I don't look at it as a weight. I look at it as a privilege. I don't have to tell you how blessed you are. Oh, are you kidding? I've got the best job in the world. So who all, besides your family members, have stayed here in this house? Um, how about Lady Gaga? Lady Gaga just did a Definitely. film. She was the latest uh, celebrity to stay here, I think. That's cool. Um, she stayed here at this house uh, when she filmed the video up at the castle. Well, I think that about says, I mean, if Lady Gaga has been here. Well, and Liz, Liz Taylor. <laughs> yeah, Elizabeth Taylor. Years, years ago. And where are we winding up to now? Well, we're, we're headed up on the, on the same road the buses use to take tourists up to the castle, which is actually a non-exclusive easement, which is our road, and they maintain it. Okay. And then we're gonna come down the, what they call the extension orchard. And this is where WR had a lot of the free grazing zoo animals, um, you know, living out in the, in the, in the open, uh, kept in by very high deer fences. And he also had a bunch of fruit and nut trees that he desired, but the climate and the soil would not support them. Really? So over the years, they, you know, they kind of faded off. And you talked about the zoo animals. Many of those animals now have integrated into the wild here. They have. We've got about 110 or 115 zebras. So we're climbing and climbing. How high up do we go? Uh, the castle's at about 1,600 feet. We're gonna stop just shy of that and, and, and come down this ridge, which will give you some great views of, I don't know, maybe 15 or so thousand acres and lots of acres of ocean. I love it. You know, I know you see this all the time, but every corner we come around takes my breath away. Do you ever get tired of this? No, but as many guests as I've ever seen walk into that building, while they're astounded by the architecture, and the fixtures and the furniture and the antiquities, they walk right through the room, right to a window and look at the view and say, you've gotta be kidding me. Really? Because in every, out of every window, the view was specifically planned. Um, you know, WR loved the ranch and he said to his mother, I'd rather spend a month here than anywhere in the world. And that's one of the famous quotes. Steve, some of these views are the prettiest I've seen around. Well, in that case, let me expand it. All of this is ranch land. This is, a, uh, well, it's a, it's a big view. It's actually a, a small part of, uh, of the entire property. And I think it's so important to tell your story of conservation, because as, as poignant and special as this land is to you, you gave a lot of it away. Well, we gave a lot of it away, and we also gave away rights that existed with the property. In 2005, Steve Hurst negotiated what became the largest California conservation easement project of its time, transferring ownership of some of the land to the state, yet ensuring that the land will always remain in the Hearst family for agriculture. The agreement limits development of these historic hills and the beautiful beaches. We enlisted the American Land Conservancy. Um, the California Rangeland Trust was always the organization we saw that was going to oversee the entire easement in perpetuity. So we had to fund the endowment to have them come and review our practices twice a year forever. So when you think about all of your family members and ancestors that have gone before you here, I want to take it back to the, to the very beginning. What would Senator Hurst think about what you're doing today? I think that 
George and Phoebe and W.R. Uh, would come here today and see it very much as they saw it when they were here. Very little has changed. I think they would very much approve of, of what we're doing here today, and I think they'd be proud of it. So now let's go forward. Okay. When they're talking about you this way, <laughs> Well, you know, there, the there, there, there was there was a sense that I had during the conservation negotiations uh, of a photo of me hanging somewhere. So that's the guy that sold the ranch, and someone said, "No, that's the guy that saved the ranch." And standing in front of the castle and the cattle, I think the guy that saved the farm is a pretty good way to end it today. I think that's a good way. Thank you. Thank you. you what an honor. No oh, pleasure. What a special trip. That's gonna do it for this edition of Rob on the Road, Hearst Castle and Ranch. We're so glad you joined us. You can check out all of our shows at robontheroad.org and send us your ideas. We'll see you next time, right here on Rob on the Road. To order a DVD copy of this program, call 888-814-3923 or visit kvie.org.